Hi, this is Roger Hanegraaff, Texas A&M University, Kingsville, and I wanted to provide you a video that introduces you to the concepts of agricultural economics or agricultural business. Really, the two areas describe the same sector of our agricultural economy. Now, agricultural business or economics is not just the only area, of course. We've got animal systems and industries and input sectors that relate to that. We've got plant systems, environmental, biotechnology, um, uh, uh, production, agricultural machinery related items, technology. The agricultural industry is very diverse and very complex. Agricultural economics and business is one of those sectors. And in fact, the USDA has a job outlook. And when they produce that job outlook for the last several decades, agricultural business and economics is the number one employment area, representing right now about 49% of the jobs. So it's important to understand the area of agribusiness and ag economics, as well as important for your job and your future, but it is also indirectly secondary valuable to the rest of the agricultural sector. Farmers and ranchers that are in the production sector, um, the idea of hunters that have uh, natural resources that they manage, all of these industries benefit and require knowledge of agribusiness and ag economics. So it's an important sector to learn more about adding tools to your toolbox. So in my video today, I wanted to go over aspects of the agricultural industry, and I want you to take notes as I create my set of notes. You writing down your work will help you better remember the information, and hopefully if your teacher asks you questions, you've got a reference to go back and take a look at. All right, what are we going to go over today? Our learning objectives are simple. First, I want to define and describe ag economics. What is it all about? What are some common terms that relate to it? And what are some basic factors that influence ag economics and things that we measure? Next, I want to talk about how do we illustrate economic principles. You know, when you're talking about the livestock production sector or the crop production sector, it's really easy to measure growth based on visual interpretation. Now, ag economics is a little bit more abstract and things are harder to define. So we illustrate economic or business in certain terms. And I want to give you two examples or two ways that that will be defined. And then the last is I want to introduce the concept of what we call a market. Agricultural economics and business are focused in trying to understand and predict future trends. And that really always relates to a market. So those are kind of the objectives I have. Take notes again, follow along, and make sure you can keep up and make sure that you can understand each of these three aspects as we work our way through. All right, let's start talking about what is agricultural economics. So let's begin with that. So ag economics is this industry or part of our sector that really relates to management. So it's management of resources. And these resources are related to the production of food and fiber in the entire industry. Not only is it production of food and fiber, but it's all the services that connect to those processes. And we could be talking about not only food production for our, um, for our food chain, but it also might be even entertainment, agritourism. The agricultural sector is very diverse. And so there's lots of different resources that we involve. In fact, we'll talk a lot about resources in a second. But ag economics is the management of these resources. But how can we define how this management of these resources is accomplished? Well, first of all, in ag economics, and in fact, I should say ag economics or economics is really a social science. It's a hard science in some ways. And so we're going to start with the number one aspect of ag economics, and that is the defining of facts. You know, if you're thinking of corn production, very common pro product in agriculture, when you think of corn production, there are certain things that we need to know that we do know, like acres that are involved in production. Uh, trade probably is going to be a, an effect or related to corn production or all areas of production. So quantity of produced of acres or planted of acres and harvested trade. Uh, we could even look at prices. These are all going to be examples of things that we can define. They are quantifiable and they are really dictated or not dictated. They're described in ag economics as facts, things we can understand. Unemployment, gross domestic product called GDP. 
These are examples of quantifiable values that we know and we can define. In fact, we can get history of those values. And we can even try to predict forward these facts. But ag economics, management of resources is not only going to use facts, but it needs to understand the other parts of our economy, which are going to be centered around beliefs. Beliefs are going to be things that we define as society, things that we think should be that way. For example, in agriculture, a lot of ag policy originated from the concept of parity, meaning that if you were involved in the early 1900s in dairy production, then policy came in in the Depression age in the, in the late 20s to try to kind of define what you needed as a producer in the dairy industry to make money. And the government policies were trying to supply agricultural producers with those needs, that gap, to try to keep them in business because food production was essential. So a lot of programs developed like, uh, like school lunch and uh, women, infants, and children programs. In fact, the number one line item in the USDA budget today is food nutrition for our society. So agriculture is ingrained into the beliefs of society that we ought to be able to afford food and it should be readily available. So a lot of programs in policy are going to say that should always be true. We should have food products to consume at a good price. Well, continuing through ag economics, it's not only going to involve facts and what we believe things should be, but there's even a deeper connection to values. Values really kind of frame uh, how our society values items and what we think is um, worth value. And so our worth or our value could be dollars or could be some kind of rating of what we think are important. But our economy is not only based on facts, what we think should be true, it's even going to swing with pendulums of what we call valuable items and things can change over time. For example, today there's a lot less uh, unfortunately, a lot less focus or worry if ag producers can maintain production. There is a lot of worry today about the quality of product and the way the product is marketed or grown. And those things are opportunities for our industry to latch a hold of and try to, and try to use. But the idea of values starts to seep into our understanding of the ag economy. And then finally, the last and uh, definitely not the least is our goals as a society. So these are going to be what develops the targets that we want to achieve. And you can look outside of even agricultural economics and the ag sector and move into other parts of our society like healthcare and like taxes and the way we build programs and policies to try to help encourage. And they really begin with facts, things that are true, beliefs, values, and goals are important to latch hold of. And there are more than this, of course, but these are ways we can describe that ag economics or economics is a social science. These beliefs, values, and goals can change over time. Society and the way social environments interact and create political environments that interact, which create and bounce off social environments, will come into our world of ag economics. Even though facts may paint a different picture, these things are part of what we wrestle with in ag economics. Now, these are not only descriptions or descript descriptors of what e ag economics is about, but there are also some terms that we can plug right into this discussion. And let's start with our first term. Let's go with a uh, scarcity. Now, scarcity feels, fits perfect as a term because this really defines this idea that um, maybe wants or needs exceed the quantity that is available out there in society. And so when our needs exceed our wants, then we end up with something called scarcity. Now in ag economics, scarcity is not just about needs. Scarcity is about what we defined in our example earlier, and that is resources. And so these resources involve scarcity and ag economics is trying to manage that. So you may say, well, what are resources in ag economics or agriculture that balance to this concept of scarcity? And they're really traditionally laid out as land, labor, capital, 
and then finally, management. So these resources, land, labor, capital, and management, are the scarce resources that in ag economics, we deal with the fact of utilizing these, and then society's beliefs, values, and goals kind of dictate a little bit about the availability of land and what land we're able to use in our production areas. Some areas of agriculture traditionally have grown specific crops, but the land's productive value and what it takes to get those crops grown typically may have cost too much. So that production's moved away and hopefully another alternative has come in to take its place in a more, um, in a more competitive or comparable advantage situation. So land is a scarce resource. And in agriculture, urban sprawl, moving into areas where urban areas are developed and get larger and larger and larger, can take away land from our productive capability. So scarcity in ag economics is management of land. Labor, well, labor is the, is the answer of people are needed to produce. And since the Industrial Revolution, Folks have moved from rural areas into urban environments and taken on different jobs. So labor is still a scarce resource and one that we try to manage and attract. Now, in some cases in agriculture, we have removed labor or tried to remove labor because that is where we bring in technology and machinery. And that has helped some, but we still have a labor shortage and something we have to manage and how we do that in agriculture. And then finally, capital. And capital is a word used in lots of ways, but capital refers to money. So when we think about capital, think of money because the money that we need to run our businesses is definitely a scarce resource. Banks and the way farm policy tries to encourage lending from our banks to the ag sector is going to really dictate and be related to, again, the capital allocation of resources. And back again to facts, beliefs, values, and goals, where should that money go in our entire society is a makes it a scarce resource. And then finally, management. And hopefully that is some of you, as you learn about the exciting area of ag economics and business, you getting into that sector and being part of the solutions through your training later on through education or your work is gonna help you hopefully be someone that improves our overall system in agriculture. So management, scarce resource. Land, labor, capital management, typically defined as scarce resources and connected to ag economics. All right, what's another important term that we should talk about? And that is this idea of marginal analysis. And so, I'm gonna equate marginal analysis, or really I wanna focus on marginal. What does it mean? It means to understand the value of change. So a good example I can think of here is I took a group of students to the King Ranch uh, a good while back and T.O. Clayberg, one of the family heirs, was actually the CEO and operating the ranch. He had all the managers come into one of their one of their uh, structures and houses where they, had a, where they had meetings. And my students were able to ask him some questions. And one student asked a great question. He said, what is the number one factor or thing that you think about in running this operation? You know, they've got feed mills, they've got um, cow-calf operations, of course, replacement females operation, of course, grain production, feed yards, turf grass, citrus, they have a lot of industries. And so Mr. Clayberg said the answer is measuring the value of a change. He equated it to like the score of a football game. If you're at a particular point in any game, there is a score. And if you wait and calculate the score in the next quarter, you can come up with lots of stats about the average score in the quarter, the average point scored every minute or two. However, more value exists in not understanding just the average and the average production of a, of a yield of bushel for an acre of grain production, or the average weaning weight of a cow, or the amount of cost at, on average it takes to get a calf to the feed yard operation. Those are average values that are important to know. Mr. Clayberg focused on the idea that knowing those is important, but real managers understand that answer, then they employ management techniques, and then they see a change, and they measure that change. That's called marginal analysis. And really, that's the most important way to analyze information. And ag economics focuses on average production, average values, but it also tries to get to the concepts of marginal analysis. And so that term's important in all economics, but in ag economics, it's a core term that you should be familiar with. So what does marginal mean? Marginal means change. Marginal analysis is measuring the change in a decision.
All right, another term that's important for us to talk about is going to be this concept called opportunity cost. So opportunity cost is kind of just what it describes to be. It is a way to measure cost, but opportunity cost is an economic term, term that's used to measure the value given up. So when we make a decision, we change from one alternative to another. So for example, easier way to define opportunity cost is that if we had a hay operation, we cut hay three times during the summer, had a great set of yield. The fourth hay cutting is one that we're thinking about doing. If we fertilize again, if we, if we get the right rain at the end of the year, if we don't get our cold weather, if it'll lay off just a bit, there's possibility we can put some money into this field and try to get a fourth cutting. Now, you may say, well, the question is, Roger, how much does it cost to get that fourth cutting and what revenue would you collect? Well, that is called accounting profit. That's going to look at what your actual revenue is minus your actual expenses, and hopefully that makes you money. But a deeper decision would be to understand that and then to step back and say, what's our alternative? The alternative for, for example, a extra cutting of hay might be to actually have someone come in and graze that land to collect that extra forage out there. That grazing would cost us not anything hardly at all, assuming it's fenced, and we were able to actually collect some money. So the question is, the accounting profit of I'm going to harvest this much hay and earn this much money, I'm going to spend this money to do that, as long as I can make a profit, it's good, but you should hold on a minute opportunity cost would tell you what value are you giving up. So if you are giving up a value, an alternative to any decision, and every decision's got an alternative, if you can find what that value is, you might identify that the profit made by putting in all that money and putting that at risk actually is not enough you could actually lease it and the net gain would be better. That's called opportunity cost. What is the value given up from one decision to another? So you've got the decision to harvest that fourth K cutting. You know what those costs are. You ought to look and see, what could I lease that ground for? And if it brought in enough money that covered that accounting profit, then opportunity cost would tell you, don't try to get that fourth cutting of hay. It's too risky and it involves potential for loss. Go with this other alternative. And that's factoring in the concept called opportunity cost. All right, so this is an introduction to ag economics. It's a complex industry. Ag economics, facts, beliefs, values, and goals is focused on producers and the decisions that they make. It's focused on policy that the policymakers make and focused on what society thinks about that policy and the industry. It's focused on trade. It's focused on technology. It's focused on weather shift. Ag economics is a complex industry and trying to understand facts, beliefs, values, and goals and important terms are tools for your toolbox to hopefully make you or hopefully equip you to make better decisions as you move. All right, so ag economics, that's a term that I hope you're familiar with and the details that relate to it. More terms will come in later as we go through some other topics. Now let's talk about how do you illustrate all of this? It seems pretty abstract, but it's able to be illustrated. And how do you illustrate economics? Really, there's two ways, and I want to go over each of those. Let's start with the first one. The first one's going to be a mathematical illustration of ag economics. For example, let's just say that we've got the net profit to produce corn. And so mathematically, that is a valuable variable. And that is going to be equal to, let's just say, well, how much is the price of corn times how much did I produce of corn? That's going to give me a revenue. And if I have that revenue, of course, I have to take out my cost. And so if I understood any of these variables, I might be able to illustrate mathematically the profit for a corn producer, let's say per acre. Now, you continue to get complicated because the cost and the price, excuse me, and the quantity might relate to plus or minus issues that relate out there the center around, let's say, trade. As a nation in the U.S., we produce somewhere in the neighborhood of 20% of the world food production. However, we are about 5% of the world's population. So 
We actually have uh, quite a bit of product we produce and we can't consume it, and so exports are important. Those plus or minus trade might kind of alter this price a little bit. When it comes to production and the cost, plus or minus issues might come in to weather things that come about. So our mathematical equation of the net profit for a corn producer, producer could be defined by some variables. And if we knew these variables, we could solve for any of the other variables that we did not know. And sometimes that's how we apply mathematical equations. Now, these don't have to be linear as well. They could be quadratic type equations where there's not a single relationship, but it varies. So mathematically is a great way to illustrate this concept of ag economics, and we will use it some of our examples. Now, what's another way? It's a little more fun, and that is going to be illustrating ag economics from a graphical standpoint. So graphing is something you probably learned in your geometry courses, and in fact, you're going to end up with a simple x and y axis. That's typically the y axis. That's typically x. These are typically, of course, negative values, and it always starts with zero. So as I move up this axis, whatever y is just gets bigger. And as I move across this axis of x, everything I go further away from the origin just gets bigger. And so it's a great way to of how we could see how are these variables interacting. So for example, let's go with uh, the net profit from a corn producer, and that's the Y variable. So the further I can get up this line, the more money I am making per acre. And then if we wanted to look at things that impact that, we could look at any of these variables. But let's look at one that may be interesting, and that is the year. So as we produce across different years, again, I'm getting further and further out into the today until I move further away. So if this is a year, let's say year one, whatever that represents, and I have this much profit per acre, then the relationship is something like that intercept. Now, if I continue to look at the next year, I might find a huge increase in yield, or not in yield, but in profit, which could have been from yield or could have been from the market. And so if you connect those two dots, you do have what we call a relationship. And we would say that relationship is positive because as you move further out, you increase here. That's a positive relationship. Now, mathematically, we can define positive and negative relationships as well. But in graphical situations, it's easy to define. Let's say we move further out and we ended up with a, another increase. And you could say that is a positive relationship, but we definitely would say that the relationship here and here are not the same because the slope of the lines is definitely a different situation. Now, after we look at this illustration, we can continue through time. And let's say that we find a drop here in the future. Once again, we connect these lines and now you would say, what kind of relationship do we have here? Well, it's not a positive relationship, it's a negative. Because I'm going further out in time, but I'm dropping my revenue. So graphical illustrations, mathematical illustrations, are ways we can describe or show the results of facts, beliefs, values, and goals across terms that relate to decisions we might make in agricultural business or economics. All right, last thing is I want to cover this concept of a market because all of this is trying to understand better what we call a market. And in agriculture, we have quite a few different markets. And so this topic of market is a giant term, and I'm going to kind of just keep it basic today. A market could be anywhere that you have two things, and you have to have both of these. Number one is you have to have something called demand. Now, what is demand? Demand is this concept that people want or they need certain products or services. So what are some examples of demands? Let's just say eggs. Large eggs is something that we sell by the dozen, and that is a demand that's out there. People want or need those products, and their wants and needs are going to be include some factors. So what are some factors of demand? Now, there's several here, but let's list those really quickly, and you make sure you write them down. One of those is going to be the amount of money that consumers have. The more money consumers have, 
likely the more product they will probably buy. So the amount of money they have, disposable income. So policy, like taxes, that takes money out of their pocket will alter demand or disposable income that people can use in the marketplace. So demand is infected by the amount of money people have. Well, the number of consumers out there, just the number of those customers would also affect demand. If you had a certain area of our economy or geographic region that didn't have very many people in it, if you tried to bring products and sell those there, you're not going to get very much sold. There's just not a lot of people. So you'd say it's not a lot of demand. Now, the price could be very high, but we're talking about demand, the number of people out there. So money makes demand go up. Numbers of people involved in our industry that want our products makes demand go up. And then the last one that includes a lot of uh, aspects is going to be taste and then I'll put preferences with there as a description. Taste and preferences are just describing what consumers want and that changes over time. A great example is going to be grass-fed beef. You know, if you go back not too far, grass-fed beef was kind of a novelty, small scale, not a large scale product. Why? Because you needed forage and it was just difficult to really do efficiently. So it was thought of as kind of unique, like a niche, small niche market. However, our producers, again, looked at that and saw the demand, saw the number and the availability and the willingness to pay extra for it. And so our industry has evolved and wrapped our head around that. And now we have a lot better supply chain of grass-fed beef to meet the taste of preferences that are out there. There's other variables that fall into that, but that's an example of what demand is. Now, you can't have a market without just demand. You have to, of course, have what we call supply. And most of these terms really are self-explanatory, but supply is related to our ability to have production. So our ag producers, our production sector, and all the other variables that come into that are really what create the supply of food to meet these demands. Now, what are some factors of supply? Well, again, it's going to be the number of producers out there. And so I'm going to put number of producers. That's going to kind of be related to, let's just say, nobody's doing grass-fed beef hardly at all. All of a sudden, they come up with ways to lease pastures, rotate pastures, large-scale leases become available. Certain types of cattle actually do a better job in a grass-fed environment. All of those things get learned about. More producers know it, the more are involved in it, and that's going to help reach that demand. Number of producers. Uh, what's another example? And that's going to be technology. So as technology changes, that technology is going to help us manage that cost a little bit, and that's going to help us increase or improve our markets, and then I might as well plug in efficiency. And so that's the idea of just getting better at handling cost. Supply is really all about producers being able to make a profit, at least in the long run. Now, in the short run, you might have a producer that's willing to supply product and not make any money, but they can't keep that up. So the idea is that long-term production is going to be related to profit. Demand is going to be really centered around need, as we talked about. And now these two things have to exist or you don't have a market. So before we leave this idea of a market, what are the variables that connect to these? Well, the first variable that I'm going to talk about is going to be price. The second variable that I'm going to talk about is going to be quantity. Now, quantity and price are the variables, but with price, you've got price for the demand, for the consumer, and then you've got price for the supplier. Now, if these two things are very close together, then you've got an efficient market. What about quantity? You've got quantity demanded, and then you've got quantity supplied. Once again, if these two are close together, then we have what we call a balanced economy. Now, if you get situations where these are not related to each other very well, then you end up with things like we talked about, scarcity. If you have a situation where the quantity demanded 
really, really exceeds how much is able to be supplied, that's going to involve scarcity and that's going to cause price to change. And that's going to create a different situation. People are going to flood into that market. And then at some point that might switch and you may have way more supply than you have demand. That's going to jump over here and alter these prices. And so in many cases, we have the idea of a surplus where we have too much product. Surpluses, shortage, price, quantity, they all flow into this concept of better understanding a market. That market is able to be understood through illustrating with graphical and mathematical equations to help us better understand these variables and what impacts price and quantity. These tools help us then look at the way we run our businesses with common terms, tools for your toolbox to do a better job. And then they relate really to trying to understand facts, beliefs, values, and goals. That's what makes up our economy. That's what makes up agricultural economics. Now, economics, again, is a social science. There's a macro view where we're looking at really, really big picture things. There's a micro view where we're looking at really, really small things. Ag economics has both macro and micro views, but it is an important part of our international and domestic economy. And something I hope you will learn more about. Hopefully this information gets you started. And again, make sure you're taking good notes and you can answer the questions that may be asked later. Thanks.